Well, good morning. And I uh, thank you all. Thank all. Thank you to all of you for coming this morning um, at such an early hour. I want to especially you know, I want to thank James and I recognize my daughter, Susanna Lauer, who's lived here for, in Dubai for five years with her family. My friend, uh, Dr. Michael uh, Lebozer, uh, um, and my colleagues from Zayed University and from the students, uh, the students of Middlesex, thanks so much uh, for coming this morning. Uh, James asked me to talk about transparency. And when he did, I was a little bit puzzled because a talk about transparency, accountability, and the, uh, the pressures to break a story in this 24-7 news environment, uh, you know, being more important than getting things right and being accurate, those are really questions that we address all the time in my media ethics and values class, but I thought, well, how do I do this with, with uh, pictures? In fact, I had an email from Dr. Mike yesterday, who many of you know, and he said, quote, when many journalists get it wrong, there's, they are not shameful, nor are they brought to book, and I think that's really true. Um, and I ha so I think you know uh, sessions like this where we can really talk about our work, talk about how things were done, uh, sort of dissect what we did right and more maybe equally as important as what we did wrong, and to share with the public um, how things are are made. It's really a, a great thing, and we th I, I really thank all the people um, here for hosting us. Now, um, usually people begin to talk with a funny story. And I guess I have one of my own. I've been the author of what, about four, four or five books and then been the photographer of four or five other ones, including a cookbook about Vietnamese cuisine, which in Vietnam is sort of my favorite country. I'll show you some pictures of this, um, of Vietnam this morning. But, uh, and you might think, well, this guy, you know, must know a lot about uh, all these different subjects. Well, my wife, Barbara, is uh, frequently heard to say that knowing nothing about a subject has never stopped Steve from doing a book about it. And uh, I, I think that that's really true, that really what we bring to, uh, we journalists bring to our work more is a natural curiosity and a sort of a hunger to learn more. And through that hunger, why we sometimes produce stories and articles and, and even books. Anyway, um, let's kind of get right to it. I, I, I'll have some pictures in just a second, obviously. But, you know, the two big problems when we talk about transparency and accountability, for those of us who are visual journalists, I think the, the first one is that our professional ethics, our professional values frequently come into conflict with our personal values and the values, the things that make us human, our human values, our moral values, our social values, gender values, um, et cetera. And um, we photojournalists are often uh, accused, moreover, of using people as a means to an end. And I, if you can, um, James, help me maybe turn down the lights a bit. Um, okay. Turn down the lights. This idea of using people as a means to an end, it, it would really give old Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, whose grave I have seen in, in uh, in Kaliningrad, there we go, uh, fits. But um, we really do very frequently tell a story through, through the eyes and, and the, the, the life of a single person. Um, and you know, the title of my talk, that unblinking look. In fact, I was in Ethiopia during the famine of 1985. And, um, uh, and you know, much like a, a physician like Dr. Mike, you have to have just a, a wee bit of distance to be able to do some of this, this mother arrived at a Red Cross uh, clinic and just, you know, too late to save this child who was dying in, in her, her hands and arms. And, you know, we, 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 we see things at close range. We try to bring an intimacy uh, to our work. But it is the idea of what, what the deontologists or the people who believe uh, ethically in, in uh, sort of universal duties and universal values and universal rights that, that it, it would give them fits because, among other things, those ethicists believe that we should never use people as a means to an end. But here's uh, uh, on the streets of uh, Calcutta, India, a, a beggar using a child. And, and students, if you want to come along the bar here, I think that would probably be a good idea. You're going to be able to see the photographs a lot better if you come along the bar here. And I guess I should say by the end of my presentation, 
um, you may need, uh, they may open the bar, uh, and you may need something a little stronger than coffee. So this conflict, so this idea of using pe people as a means to an end. Uh, also in Ethiopia during that famine, I came into a clinic and there was a, a, a little girl who was naked and a, a nurse quickly clothed her in a discarded red, red Cross grain sack. But, and she became the lead picture for a story about the worldwide work of the International Committee of the Red Cross, their humanitarian work in war zones uh, around the world. I went to 14 wars with them in um, eight months. And, uh, but it is the idea of using people as a means to an end, which you know, for those of us who sort of believe in um, this idea of consequentialism, which we're supposed to use in the classroom, but the basic idea of social utility, there's some basic social value um, achieved by what we do, even though there may be a harm caused to uh, individuals, but there's a greater social good that's uh, uh, the result of our work. Um, we photojournalists also um, have to take, as I say, that unblinking look at life um, and put ourselves in places where there's danger, where there is controversy, where there's conflict. This was May Day, uh, May 1st, 1990, in Red Square in Moscow. It was supposed to be the normal workers' parade. That's how the picture was used in National Geographic as a fold-out. It was supposed to be uh, a normal workers' parade, the happy workers in, in the Soviet Union. It turned out that 200,000 pro-democracy demonstrators converged on Red Square from six sides to demand an end to the Communist Party, to demand an end to authoritarian rule, and to, to demand democracy. And there was really, and, I, and Mikhail Gorbachev was forced off of Lenin's mausoleum, but this one Russian colonel with his flag out there calling the pro-democracy demonstrators traitors, um, I think, um, you know, again, we tried to tell a story through one person. Now, for all the, our lofty ideas, ideals, so the next thing I was going to talk about were the power relationships. And, and it's a picture by a South, Africa, South African photographer named Kevin Carter. Uh, it was a picture taken in Sudan outside a refugee camp in 1993. And we have an emaciated, a starving little girl who is being stalked by a vulture. And the picture um, was transmitted worldwide by the Associated Press. And it won the Pulitzer Prize for news photography in 1993. Um, when we talked, though, about transparency and accountability, soon after Kevin Carter, the South African photographer who took it, soon after he won the Pulitzer Prize, he started to be interviewed, and interviewed widely. And it turns out that he waited for two hours for this perfect alignment of the vulture and the starving child, and for the light, for the sun to become lower in the sky, and give us an, a little bit more of a golden uh, hue to it, and I think that we could all agree probably the human thing is for pick that kid up and take her inside that refugee camp. Instead, he waited for two hours to get the perfect picture, and it's that idea of the, so much of our work involves kind of an imbalance in power relationships. You know, I'm the big fat white guy with the camera, and the people before my lens so often don't have a chance to talk back, and I think sometimes the, the larger the media organization we represent, why the bigger the problem. These are our journalistic values, and I just sort of throw them up on uh, uh, the uh, screen. You know, truthfulness, accuracy, independence, objectivity, fairness, fairness to the facts, uh, skepticism, we verify things, we provide a marketplace for idea, public service. In the Western democracies, we're a watchdog of government and hold officials accountable for their actions and deeds. Um, we want to provide a diversity of sources and audiences. And as I talk to students, we want to provide, give a voice to those who are voiceless. Um, we want to be accountable and transparent um, in sessions like this and admitting to people what we don't know uh, in, when there's breaking news. We very frequently today will say, this is what we know, but this is also what we don't know. There are times we need to be aggressive or even courageous, but there are equally those times where we need to be discreet. We will always, we journalists will always need, um, will always know more than we publish or broadcast. And there's that fine line between what the public would need to know and what the public would like to know. And we're, um, we need to uh, uh, minimize the harm to individuals, to governments, and um, et cetera. I'm going to uh, tell you my own story about the conflict 
in uh, between our professional and our personal values. This is a New York, short New York Times story from September 2nd, I think, to, uh, 1984. I was supposed to be going to Stanford University um, that fall to start a program. Susanna was, I don't know, her school at Palo Alto had a robot in it. I remember that was cool. But um, at the last minute, I was asked to go to Kabul, Afghanistan to do a short story on the city being occupied by the Soviet Union. Uh, we'd been able to get a visa for myself and a writer um, for about 10 days yeah, this from the Soviet Union, um, actually. So anyway, I arrived in Kabul, I think it was August 30th, 1984, and I'm waiting for my luggage. Now, why I wore a blue blazer that day to go to Kabul is anybody's guess, but I'm waiting there in the baggage claim area and chatting with someone, and all of a sudden, a terrorist bomb explodes. And one minute I'm standing up talking to someone, the next minute I'm laying flat on my back, and dust and noise and um, complete disorientation, and I'm covered with blood. And so I'm patting myself down like I was taught to do as an officer and, you know, going to Vietnam and see where you're hurt. And I realized I wasn't hit. I looked to my right, and the guy next to me had his arm completely severed by flying glass. So as we've been taught to do in the military, I pulled off my belt, I put a tourniquet on his arm, and with the people who weren't hurt or were, we started to evacuate the wounded and the injured out to the parking lot at the Kabul airport. Well, to make a long story short, the writer with whom I was working was nowhere near this uh, b the blast. He was in the hotel, the Continental Hotel, about 10 miles away. And um, in fact, he and I, I, I guess I should say, in, in the 10 days we stayed there, we depleted the wine cellar of the Continental Hotel uh, because the last night they served us beer. But anyway, uh, seven weeks later, I'm uh, uh, out of Stanford, and I get a call from the editor of National Geographic who asked me, where are your pictures of the bombing? And I sort of told him a longer version of this story. And it turns out the writer, without ever being there, had made the lead, the first two paragraphs, of his story about this terrorist bombing, having never been part of this and never seen it. And I explained to the editor of National Geographic that my duty at that moment was to try to help fe fellow human beings who were injured, who, whom people I might be able to help, uh, et cetera. And it really didn't cross my mind for more than a second to take out a camera and stop photographing this carnage. Uh, the editor started shouting me, at me on the phone Later, I saw him in his office, and veins of his neck were bulging. And he suspended me from National Geographic without pay for several weeks. And, and I won't repeat the, his profanity, but at the end of his profanity-laced um, uh, tirade, he said, we sent you to Kabul to take photographs, not to play Florence Nightingale. Now, Florence Nightingale was a nurse who helped start the Red Cross in wartime in the uh, 19th century. but. Today, I'm happy to say that in visual journalism and in other forms of journalism, we do give awards to journalists who were good Samaritans, journalists who put aside their notebooks, put aside their video cameras, put aside their still cameras, and did the human thing rather than um, the, um, uh, the professional thing. Um, this was my view out of my hotel window. Every night that I was in Kabul, there was a uh, the Mujahideen was firing rockets into the Soviet military base, which was in downtown Kabul. And I just had to sort of save that as a kind of a memory of what it was like. Um, I'm not sure that Susanna was aware of this. She was a child. But it took me about a year to recover from that experience. Because as a, in the military, you're prepared for you're prepared for anything, but you're, you're protected with your, your protective clothing, your helmet and your weapons and your tactics. And you're, you know, you're ready for trouble. And you have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, and you have comrades. In the military, one of our core values is we don't leave people behind. And you know when things go wrong, there's always going to be somebody there to help you. And you're prepared for trouble when you're a civilian in the middle of a terrorist incident, as I found myself, why you have none of that. You are alone. It is unexpected. It is, in, it is more than intimidating. It's terrifying. And I teach a course in reporting war and terrorism. And at least when we get to the section on terrorism, I can give them some sort of firsthand uh, account of what it's like to 
the experience of terrorism. Okay, the role of photography in visual journalism. Basically, three big traditions, three big ideas. One is to be society's professional eyewitness, to um, give that testimony in the court of public opinion that things happen. Second thing is to expose social evils, almost from the, ver the very moment that we found a way in the late 19th century to reproduce photographs. Those photographs that were reproduced were used to expose social ills. Uh, the work of um, uh, as, uh, uh, Lewis Hine, an anthropologist whose work on child labor, his photographs of child labor helped enact the 1914 child labor laws in the United States. And then I think our third great tradition is to show us our connections to one another, to show us our common humanity, to show us how we are all part of that great human family. In 1956, there was an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art called The Family of Man. Uh, today, we'd probably call it The Family of Humankind. But it showed life, those great rituals in life from birth to death and everything in between uh, among a variety of cultures. And uh, that was 1956. That book is still on Amazon's top 25 list. Uh, in 2016. But anyway, to bear witness to history, here's the Mount St. Helens volcano uh, in the state of Washington in the United States uh, after it exploded. And uh, the explosion was 500 times stronger than the atomic bombs the United States dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. It blew the whole top, uh, top 1,500 feet off of the volcano and the entire north face. And what I was trying to do late in the evening was to show that this volcano was connected to a whole tectonic system in the, in the Washington state where my dean, Michael, is from. Here's Mount Rainier and Mount Adams, uh, also part of that same sort of underground plumbing system that uh, uh, could explode from time to time. You know, how do we take things? The Seychelles Islands, where I'm sure a lot of you have vacationed, um, Silhouette Island in the background. I admit to, be, being, to sitting uh, at my hotel in the coffee shop having a beer with a diplomat from the U.S. Embassy who was telling me about how the North Koreans were helping people to grow rice, uh, if you can imagine the North Koreans helping people to grow rice. And uh, at that moment, I started to see this sunset, and I had no camera. I had to run back to my hotel and get the camera, and you know, fortunately, those kids animated the picture. Um, several of you in the audience have a familiarity with Hawaii. These are the poly cliffs outside of Honolulu, where uh, King Kamehameha the Great fought a, a very bloody battle in it was 1795 to sort of solidify his control over the Hawaiian Islands. But how do we get these kind of spectacular National Geographic images? Uh, Honolulu is only about six miles away. Well, you know, light is a key here. And I talk to students all the time about light being our single most important storytelling elements. And, and I was trying to, I was doing a story at the time about the revival of Hawaiian culture. And I found an ancient hula uh, group. And I wanted, and this was illustrative, I wanted to show them um, doing their hula, but in a setting that would really bring to life uh, the island of Kauai. And this is Waimea Canyon, which is often called the Grand Canyon of the Pacific. I suppose you've been there, Michael. How did I get those people up on the cliff? Realizing this is not journalism, but it's illustration for a historic, an article about uh, uh, Hawaiian culture. I actually helicoptered this group up to the cliff after rec uh, doing a reconnaissance. We threw out a smoke grenade to see which way the wind was blowing. And then the pilot hovered just very gently with one skid here on the edge of the cliff, and I got out and then helped the dancers get out, and then the pilot gave me a radio and a smoke, and a, a, another smoke grenade, and he said, when you're done taking your picture, throw, call me and throw another smoke grenade so I can see which way the wind is blowing, and we'll come and pick you up. So there's a, a lot that goes into some of these pictures. Sometimes it's just pure intuition. I was doing a book a couple of years ago on the global Indian diaspora, the 25 million people of Indian origin who live outside of India. And I was sitting with my wife in, in uh, midtown Manhattan on a Saturday, and I said, geez, you know, I, I just don't have that right picture to show the aspirations that people have to come to kind of a place like the United States. I said, the picture I'd really like is if I could find Indians at the Statue of Liberty. And she said, well, our theater tickets are not till 4 o'clock, so um, <laughs> let's go down to lower Manhattan and see and take the boat. Uh, she's spent a lot of time in New York. She said, let's take the boat out to the Statue of Liberty. Well, 
you know, about half of the people on the boat were of Indian origin, and it was uh, pretty easy to find that picture of the aspiration to come to the United States. My own students, um, you know, that taking that unblinking look at life, go, coming to the, uh, to the football game in the fall uh, 30 minutes early and seeing what's called tailgating. Our American students, the great tradition of drinking and partying and dancing before uh, the football game. And notice there isn't a single person looking at the old fat white guy taking the picture. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I guess more to the point of, of, of documenting um, these very difficult um, situations and per taking that unblinking look at life. I've had a report on two famines. The first in Bangladesh in 1974, where about 1.5 million people died in the course of a, oh, four to six weeks in late 1974. And I think empathy is one of these things that we really need to teach more in our media and communication schools to be, teach students to be able to reach out and put themselves in the shoes of others and try to feel what others are feeling. Um, I had a professor, this little girl, obviously waiting in line, hungry and nothing to eat and alone. And a professor of psychiatry at George Washington University called me up after this was on the cover of National Geographic and he said, I'd like to talk to you about this picture and I'd like to talk to you about what you were feeling at the time. And as a kid, I spent a fair amount of time alone, and I almost, you know, I, I, I had this feeling when I was taking her picture and there was all this other stuff going on. I, I get it. I get that feeling of being alone as a kid. Not hungry, of course, when you look at my size. But, um, and, and, you know, that, that crush of people to, to get food was just overwhelming. And um, I arrived at the, the Dhaka rail station in time to see a poor woman give birth just on the, beside the tracks. And I did try to help as much as I could. There was the, the placenta and stuff. And I put my camera down and tried to be of assistance and find something to wrap the baby up. But there was this scene at the Dhaka rail station of, and the, the food riots on the streets uh, and in some of the camps in Dhaka. And I remember going back to my hotel and writing in my journal that this would have been Thanksgiving Day in the United States, the day on which we sort of gather in a very secular way to um, give thanks for all of our blessings. And child is suffering from malnutrition. Um, you know, you have to, as Christian Amanpour, the chief foreign correspondent of CNN says, you have to be able to do your job. You've got to be able to separate yourself a little bit from the scene to be able to do your job, but not so much that you lose your humanity. It's a very fine line. Um, and a mother with her infant who had just passed away, a Red Cross nurse came out and told me they were gonna give the mother about two minutes with her child before they buried it. And the Red Cross nurse said, we've just got hundreds of kids to bury. This picture cost National Geographic about 2,000 readers. I think it was the last count was about 2,000 people canceled their subscription to National Geographic over this picture. And most of the letters went something like this. How could your photographer be so insensitive and so stupid as to go and intrude on this incredibly personal moment uh, of grief? And what I could say at the time is probably what I would say today is, it's my job, and I try to do it as sensitively as I can. Okay, um, let's move on, because there are other parts of the, of the world where we're trying to be that eyewitness. Um, some of you have heard of the Falkland Islands down in the South Atlantic off of Argentina, where Great Britain and Argentina fought a war in 1982 over, how over who controls them. The environmental after effects, even though Britain won the war, are that about 65% of the two Falkland Islands are actually are completely unusable because the Argentines use plastic mines that they buried all over those islands. And these plastic mines are gonna take about a thousand years or more to disintegrate and conventional mine detectors don't um, um, uh, detect these things. And so, so much of the Falkland Islands are um, walled off. Okay, here's a story where I will admit everything I was um, in Great Britain a couple of years ago, these are the Red Arrows, the British um, Royal Air Force demonstration team pulling through a, a, a loop at uh, probably, you know, 450 miles an hour. And I was sitting in the garden of a pub near the Royal Air Force Base at Duxford in, uh, outside of Cambridge, 
And I knew there was an air show going on and hadn't paid a lot of attention to it until the red arrows came flying right over the pub. But I actually took this picture with a Carlsberg beer in my hand and um, I set it down momentarily to, to make this picture. But um, you know, you can never underestimate the, the, uh, the, the importance of good luck. Um, and I was t taught a class in London a couple of years ago and um, American students being what they are, um, I thought I'd go looking for my students when this was the closest pub to where our um, as classes met, were meeting and of course I did find most of my class in there. But I thought that, you know, stepping up to the bar and again, we're using people as a means to an end but it happened to be a Euro Cup football game and it made a pretty good picture. But I, I would say that one of our, my measures uh, of the success of my work and others is do we bring some intimacy to our work? Is there a way of taking readers and viewers to places they can't go for themselves? And at least stepping up to the bar in a pub in London, which is a lot of fun, um, you know, is not something everybody's going to get to do. I th that's me. I think we need to admit when we, we report on conflict that I was with, flying with the French Air Force and they were testing their ability to penetrate Soviet radars at low level with these nuclear cruise missiles and I was doing something about the French that see, and I just did this quick selfie as we made a turn um, around Mont Blanc in, um, in France, but uh, you need to, we need to be clear with the public in covering conflict that there is an exhilaration in cheating death. I have uh, you know, I, I think about flying through the Mujia Pass in between Laos and Cambodia where the Ho Chi Minh Trail sort of slowed down for the Vietnamese bringing supplies. And it was like a sound and light show, the fortifications and the Mujia Pass that the North Vietnamese had. But when you came back from this, somebody took my picture standing by an F4, the F4 Phantom and I've got my helmet and I'm smiling ear to ear and you've just had this, this near death experience but you know, it, it so charged you with adrenaline and, and, and being in combat does in many ways bring out some of the best of all of us being asked to do things we were never capable, thought we were never capable of doing. And I remember coming back from Vietnam thinking, Graduate school is the easiest thing I've ever done in my life after that experience. This is a, a sniper of the French Foreign Legion. And again, good luck. I'm walking through the bush on the border with uh, Djibouti and Eritrea, and this guy sort of emerges right in front of me. And I had never seen him. And uh, fortunately, you know, I was able to make his picture. Um, I was with the French Marines in uh, Gabon in West Africa, and they got into a firefight with some bad guys and bringing their... Um, uh, wounded back um, made a, a probably a decent picture but I do think it's important for the students in the audience any of them interested in journalism we do need to learn and study foreign languages there is no way you're going to get an interpreter to go with you in the marae in the swamp and I thought I had really made it through graduate school um, twice over and had never and undergraduate school and never had to learn a, another language until I was in my 30s where I had to learn French and my 40s where I had to learn Russian and take it from me, it's got to be a lot easier in your 20s. So, um, and in, with the British Army in Belfast in Northern Ireland, the um, uh, cordoning off an area after a toy store. And the, the sentiments of the, the Catholic uh, community in um, Londonderry in Northern Ireland, the idea of no surrender, I mean we, we move around to these trouble zones to bear witness. Uh, bearing witness in Southeast Asia is, I think, uh, you know, it's where I probably find the most affection. Sunrise over the Chiang Mai, the second largest city in Thailand, and we, we try to um, improvise and adapt. I thought I was going to get up early in the morning and find a beautiful picture of the second largest city in Thailand. I didn't know it would be fog covered and you make the best of things. So I was walking through the streets of Rangoon, Burma, and here are these monks at their National Democracy Monument. And I looked up at these guys and they're looking at me and I thought, God, these guys look like a rock band. You know, people, <laughs> people pose themselves if you just wait for a second. And uh, it made a pretty good picture. And you know, I have to say that one of the secrets to doing 
this work is to be able to plan to, to anticipate what the light might be like. This, these are the temples at Angkor Wat. I would say probably there were hundreds of Korean and Chinese tourists standing over me trying to get a picture like this, but I got there first that morning. Um, and to try to animate those temples. Um, back in August of 1974, I was in Cambodia um, and the war in Southeast Asia was still going on and I was there for a fairly short time to look at Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, sort of slowly starving to death and I was uh, wounded and evacuated and I never was able to check out of my hotel or anything. I went back to Cambodia a few years ago and there was a, whole, there was a genocide in Cambodia where you know, um, two to four million people were murdered by the Khmer Rouge, um, uh, this peasant army of nominally or communist uh, insurgents. And there is today a very grim set of memorials to the people who were murdered by the Khmer Rouge. And, and I think for me, it was certainly important to go there and, and remember what happened in 1975 to 1979 and light a joystick. Um, I said that my favorite country is Vietnam. It's certainly the prettiest country in the world, I think, and having had some hand in bombing and destroying and, and whatever uh, to the country, why I've had 20 some trips back there to teach and to work and to, um, to find those moments. My students are out right now trying to find moments. And sometimes the moments come to you. I was just standing in the middle of nowhere up near the border with China and these little these uh, hill tribe girls just come scampering by me, you know? And uh, you know, your reflexes are important to be able to pull up your camera and get that picture. Reflexes are important. And to, the angle of the camera is important. I'm always impressed to go into the markets in the South, uh, the, the Vietnamese women, how they navigate these little boats. Oops. We just lost, no, we're back, we're back, okay. And uh, you know, I, I think you can't underestimate the beauty of Vietnam. This is a, the, uh, the, the uh, Lake of the Restored Sword in, um, uh, in Han Hanoi. Um, and this beautiful, you know, the red bridge that goes out to this temple. And I just found some tamarind trees to, to, to frame it and the people who've obviously Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll stand over here. Anyway, the people. And, you know, in 1969, the imperial city at Hue in central Vietnam was the center of a, a massacre by the North Vietnamese. It was the center of terrible fighting between the American Marines and the, the Viet Cong and the, uh, the North Vietnamese. And today, through the help of UNESCO and, and various governments in Asia, it's gradually being restored. And there's a certain satisfaction in going back to a place like that and seeing things um, uh, you know, coming back to life. And, and I have been out to visit the Khao Dai, which is a very eclectic uh, uh, faith that in, combines uh, uh, Christianity and Confucianism, if you can believe that, and elements of Buddhism and the elders. No, we'll see. OK, um, so we'll see the Khao Dai elders. And there is. You know, it, you might feel that there is animosity toward Americans and to the United States in Vietnam, but we have to remember 70% of the population of Vietnam has been born since the last American left. And the war with America is a distant memory, um, thank God. And yet the last battle of the Vietnam War is still being fought. And I think it's important for us to recognize that Vietnam has got one of the world's highest incidence of um, birth defects. And much of it comes, these are called Agent Orange babies. This is a child with hydrocephalus. Um, Agent or they're called Agent Orange ba babies because dioxin, which was the key chemical in something called Agent Orange, a defoliant that we sprayed on the jungles to deny the communist soldiers their sanctuaries. This has gotten into the environment and it doesn't go away. And the Vietnamese soldiers who were sprayed by, by it have passed on genetic mutations to their children and their families. We now have a third generation of kids born with hydrocephalus, without limbs, without arms, and a good deal of research going on. But Vietnam is still a poor country. These kids are abandoned by their families and shunted, shuttled off to hospitals in Saigon and Hanoi uh, to live you know, um, a with a pretty grim future now. 
Uh, Mike is a, was a pediatrician. He'll probably tell you that hydrocephalus is a fairly easy condition to treat if you get it um, soon enough. But Vietnam being a poor country, um, it's a case where someone is left to languish. And um, our, in our own country, there still are some very um, bitter memories of that war. And I was just at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. one day where a simple GI in his old clothes uh, from the 25th Infantry Division showed up to remember his comrades. Um, smoking opium. I worked on a story called The Opium Poppy, The Plant for Good and Evil. And um, in the Golden, I think this was in Laos, I, I found somebody smoking opium, but not to get high, but for pain relief, which seems to have been one of the primary reasons in a lot of these rural villages of Laos, Thailand, and Burma. And I will say I came out of here with a horrible headache. Um, uh, but to try to find an interesting way to see opium smoking. Okay, there's yours truly with his device. I was trying to show how in Mexico the Mexican government was spraying the opium poppies, but they were taking a fair amount of ground fire from the bad guys of the Sinaloa cartel. And I, I got some guy in California who makes mounts for the movies to make me a camera mount that mounted on the skid of uh, a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter. This is pre-digital and pre-everything. So I had a little infrared trigger on my camera and I got this thing hitched up and then we got up in the air and actually the writer I was working with was in the, the helicopter way above the action as we went down and sprayed the fields. This is me sitting there triggering my camera, but it was a way of, I hope, trying to find an interesting way of a very boring thing, which is to spray the opium poppy fields. But there, I, I keep thinking of the writer, I mean, safely ab ab above the action. Okay, ethical problems. Um, the editor of National Geographic said to me, Okay, you've been all over the world looking at the opium poppy, the plant for good and evil. How close is this problem to National Geographic and to the White House? They're both, you know, National Geographic and the White House are about four blocks apart. And so I called the FBI, public relations people, and the DC police. And remember, Washington DC is a federal city. It's not part of any state. And I told them my need to photograph a heroin user not something you can sort of advertise in the Washington Post, you know, Need, needed, one heroin user for a picture. And they said that they would find me, the, if they could, a, an informant, um, and that I would get a call from a young woman and she would sort of give me some instructions, and I did. And I said, well, where am I gonna meet you? And she said, come over to the Commerce Department, which is a block or so from the White House. And this is pre-9-11, so I could walk into a government office with a camera. And she said to come up to the seventh floor, and I did. And, and she said, I'll recognize you. You'll be the white guy with a camera. And I said, yes. And uh, she came wandering down the hall. And I said, well, what is, what's going to happen? And she said, well, just follow me. So we go in the ladies' bathroom. OK, why not, right? It's lunchtime. And so we go in the ladies' bathroom. And she whips out her syringe of heroin and cocaine and shoots it in her neck. And, and I had about five seconds to make some important decisions. One was to preserve her anonymity. Secondly, to get the picture that showed the action, the needle going into the neck. And then to get out of there, <laughs> it's the woman's bathroom, you know, uh, <laughs> to get out of there without getting arrested, I guess. Um, we got a lot of angry letters and more people canceling their subscriptions to National Geographic. I've never been good for business there. And, uh, and, and I do think there was a, I didn't know she was gonna be African American. I didn't know she was gonna be black. But most people at National Geographic would said, A, I need to protect my children from your magazine now because you're showing us stuff that I don't want our kids to see. And B, you're badly stereotyping African Americans. I can only say that I felt ambivalent about her race at that point because as we know, drug use knows no boundaries for race and social class. But um, you sort of t deal the hand that you're, uh, you get. Okay, uh, Latin America, you know, I'm just fun. At a, I, in my next life, I'd like to be a tango photographer in, uh, um, in uh, uh, Argentina. And I meant that a tango is just so much fun to, to photograph. But in El Salvador, I photographed political prisoners. And again, I was with the International Red Cross. And of course, they said no photographs. And I have to admit, being transparent, that when a government official anywhere says no pictures, 
that, that, to a photographer, that just means yes in a, <laughs> in a slightly different way. And, uh, and so I found a way. This guy was sort of tracking me as I was walking away. And I turned around and made the picture. And then the guards started yelling and screaming. And the writer and I ran down the hall. And of course, the poor writer that I was working with, Peter White, he fell, he fell on the stairs and broke his ankle. And so I'm helping the writer get, and I, the next day I took him to Miami to the, the doctor. So that did cost something. There is a cost to what we do, even if it's a personal cost. Um, you know, sometimes the unexpected. I go to, uh, to the Sahara to report on a drought. And the first thing I find in Niamey, the capital of uh, Niger, is that the Niger River is at kind of <laughs> is high, right? Michael's a photographer. You just, you know, well, what do you do? There's plenty of water. Um, <laughs> um, there's no drought here. You take the picture. Um, I, I had to go off with the Polisario Front guerrillas um, who are still fighting to, regain, to gain control of what was Spanish Sahara. Now it's Western Sahara. And they're kind of based themselves in southern Algeria and they're fighting with Morocco over who owns this Western Sahara, this little strip of land along the Atlantic coast. And they wanted me to, to shoot an a AK-47 uh, to know that I could protect myself. Well, I was not going to shoot it. But I, I, mean, I was not going to shoot at anybody, but I played target practice and played along. And then they gave me my own Land Rover to go with them as they were going off across Morocco into the Spanish Sahara. What I didn't know is that we were going to be driving on a road like that in the middle of the night. So for about three nights, we drove across roads like this to, um, to get to a place where they held these prisoners of war. They're Moroccan prisoners of war that the Polisario is holding. And you know, you come into a situation like this where you can actually smell the fear. And these are people in captivity. And uh, what do you do? Well. Um, you, you do your work, but you try to do it again in a way that captures this scene. Um, sometimes I was sort of struck by that shaft of light coming through the window, and the prisoner said this is the, some of the only sunlight they see, that they're kept underground in the desert. But, I, I mean, these people were prisoners, and I kind of felt, I felt terrible having to do this, but again, it's your job. Um, uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, one of these guys I was with, the Polisario. Uh, we lived in Moscow for some period of time at the end of the Cold War. We commuted there with great frequency. And this is the KGB headquarters, the headquarters of the uh, Foreign Intelligence Agency and Secret Police, the KGB. It's been replaced with something called the FSB, but it's the same bad guys. And uh, this is uh, the Lubyanka prison in, uh, Derz on Dzerzhinsky Square. And it's not in any guidebook where it's KGB headquarters, but everyone in the late 1980s knew where the KGB was. And I waited until there was an important um, Soviet holiday where Mr. Lenin's uh, picture was displayed on all the public buildings. And I went down there in my, my Burberry's trench coat with my camera under my coat. And uh, in that day, those days, I could get something under my coat. And they, um, and I, you know, just when some guy was coming, I pulled my camera out, made some pictures, and they were like, I don't know, six security guys right all over me. And you know, you can't take pictures, give us your film. And I would admit to a ruse, I was prepared to give them some film that had no pictures on it so that I could keep my film that had the picture on it because this was some place that nobody was supposed to see. Uh, sometimes just things driving across the, the, the farmlands of Ukraine at dawn, sometimes things just present themselves like a great sunrise over an Orthodox church. Um, the Soviet Union is probably, Mike, how I got started to develop asthma. You know, this, <laughs> this terrible uh, air pollution. And, you know, we can't, again, bearing witness, deny um, the environmental catastrophe that was the Soviet Union. Um, the people in Siberia, I did a story on Siberia, where what I thought were the salt of the earth. These are the pioneers and this pioneer spirit. And again, people do pose themselves, just chatting with this lady and her really cute little house, and she just was delighted. She asked to see a dollar bill, and so I pulled out a dollar bill, and she wouldn't touch it because she, she I said, well, well, just take a look. And she said, no, 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 we're, we're, it's against the law to have foreign currency. I just want to see what a dollar looks like. And, uh, um, and these pioneers, you know, people living 
rough like that, but there are people looking for, prospecting for gold and diamonds and, and hoping to be part of the expansion uh, of the economy. And sometimes, again, things just present themselves. The, the shepherd across that 4,000 miles of step of kind of nothingness. Um, and, you know, again, even if we can't speak a language, um, the, these, this is about 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle, um, we try to somehow, through sign language and a little bit of empathy, um, communicate, and in a little bit of light, the sun is behind him. Um, my wife, Barbara, was in the teepee there translating for the, uh, the writer, and, um, and, you know, we just try to find a way of portraying people and I think if you sort of present yourself as a curious person of goodwill, why it works. Um, you know, there's, I did a book about St. Petersburg and the, the beauty of this city, uh, Peter the Great built this city from nothing on a series of marshes on the, uh, the, on the uh, uh, coast of the Baltic Sea. This is the Kazan Cathedral right after a, a snow. And, you know, a young couple at the winter pal or along the Winter Canal at the Tsar's Winter Palace, which is the Hermitage Museum now. And I showed this picture the other day to students because we're talking about moments. And students said, well, well didn't you feel like a stalker as you were uh, walking behind this young couple? Because you look at their legs and it's sort of like a, they've choreographed their steps uh, in a dance class. And I said, well, I guess I did feel a little bit like a stalker, but I anticipated that something was going to happen. And there was one frame that was just right. Sometimes persistence, and I, again, I talk to students about this a lot, persistence is the key to a good photograph. This is the uh, 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 Palace Square in St. Petersburg, and it's the second largest public space in the world after um, Tiananmen Square in Shanghai, or in, uh, in uh, Beijing. And I kept going back there, and I was not happy with our, my pictures. And on my 42nd trip, to Palace Square, I was standing there with this very nice late October light, and these guys on horseback came clip clopping across my picture, and they just provided that nuance to take us back to the 18th century when, um, or the 19th century when that obelisk was erected uh, for the Russian uh, victory over Napoleon. Um, we happened to be in the Soviet Union when it was breaking up and when re suddenly President Gorbachev said there would be no restrictions on the freedom to worship and we could go to the, ortho to the churches. This was at an Orthodox monastery and the monks were having lunch and, and, uh, and, and they were praying. And, uh, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I know some of you are photographers. I had a battery failure in my Leica. And so I was trying to change batteries um, in my camera, and my wife said, you idiot, they're saying the Lord's Prayer. And all I could say is, thank God I don't speak Russian that well. And uh, I kept changing my batteries, you know, to, to get the picture. Um, and the Jews suddenly would felt that they could come out of the closet, literally, and worship in their synagogue and, and unroll the Torah and would invite you and, and just some nice window light. And uh, on to Afghanistan, I just thought I'd throw a couple of nice Afghan pictures in just despite the Soviet occupation, why um, there were, you know, the markets. And, you know, you've got to anticipate what might happen. I was sort of walking down the street behind the guy on the, the right here, and, and I could see that he recognized somebody up ahead. And when they met, there was this embrace. And, you know, it's reading the body language and anticipating the action and bringing to bear some of your experience again to find those moments on the street. I'll just sort of finish up with India here. I've spent a lot of time in India. There's the, the, the secretariat uh, where the Indian government meets at the, the Rajpath. And, and I recently did a book on Calcutta. And actually, you know, she was uh, at a temple. She was asking me for some money, um, and, which I gave her. But after I took her picture, um, um, some things are much harder than you would think. Mother Teresa's organization, the Missionaries of Charity, run about 12 institutions in Calcutta, including a hospice for the poorest of the poor who are picked up off the street. It's called the Home for the Dying Destitutes. And I went to the public relations woman for Mother Teresa's order, the Missionaries of Charity, the toughest nun from Toledo, Ohio, you'd ever meet. She wrote a three-page contract 
for a 30 minute photo shoot. You know, this pic my pictures could only be for my book. I'd do what the, the caregivers said, I'd stay in one place, and at the 31st minute, I would leave. And, you know, if you could script things from Washington, D.C., or, or Bloomington, Indiana, where we live, there'd be no need to go so often to other places. But when I went in there, the, I found the caregivers were medical students from European Union countries because to get an MD degree in the EU today, you need to work for a significant period of time among the poor. And as a, as a consumer of medical care in America, you think to yourself, you know, wouldn't that be nice? Um, so, w w you know, most of the caregivers were kids from fr France and Spain and Italy, and, and these women are all going to die. It's a hospice. Uh, but it, it did make a picture, and I came out of there thinking it's been a long time since I've been so moved emotionally to see something like this. Um, sometimes things present themselves. The rickshaw driver is perfectly balanced, or we, we go from, you know, we have a certain visual grammar we practice, just like a filmmaker, my friend Michael, our wide shot and our close-ups and our medium shots, um, a, a worker in a, uh, um, um, a jute factory. And I wanted to get an overall picture in Calcutta, and, and there you see the city's largest mosque. And I was told that this whole area, which could be nice for a, an overall that shows the old colonial architecture and the trams and you know just the decrepitude of Calcutta, that this is a Muslim area. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? So with my a friend, a fellow photographer, who's a Hindu, we went into this apartment building, Muslim only, or all Muslims, and started knocking on doors at about the sixth floor and said, Hello, I'm a professor and a photographer from the United States, and oh, by the way, a Christian, and I'm looking to see if I could stand on a balcony to get a nice picture down the street. And yeah, it may as well have been a person from, uh, from Mars standing there. And, uh, but there were people were so nice and so welcoming, and about the 15th attempt, why somebody said, oh yes, come out and take, look at, uh, from my balcony, and I thought, holy God, there's the picture. And especially when the man, the police officer in white crossed the street, why there was the frame, but you know, there's sometimes you just have to suck it up and go do it. Okay, I'll be really fast. You know, people, uh, you know, doing their uh, devotions in the morning and uh, one thing or another. Uh, this was the uh, 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 Eid prayers in New Delhi some years ago, and people say, "Well, how did you get this picture?" And I have to admit that an imam at the Jama Masjid um, said that if an incentive was offered, why I could get up into the uh, one of the minarets, and so I. Uh, offered the incentive that he wanted, which is, uh, and then I'll leave it at that. And God <laughs> in, in Jakarta, I'm going to kind of finish with the Arab world, Muslim world. In Jakarta, the, in the National Mosque, why it was a good deal easier uh, for Friday prayers. Um, and in fact, in the book I did about the Muslim world of Southeast Asia, I noted in the captions, and Indonesia, which is the world's most populous Muslim country, but very syncretic form of Islam. The Indonesians are quick to tell you our national mosque was designed by a Christian from the United States. And, uh, um, and a little girl in uh, Aceh in the tip of Sumatra <coughs> ready for prayers. Uh, my first uh, experience in this part of the world was to go to Yemen uh, just before my colleague Michael, who was there for National Geographic as well, making a film. Uh, we went out to Marib to where the Queen of Sheba had her some sort of a temple. And going to Yemen in the late 1970s was like being an extra in a John Wayne Western. You know, it was just the Wild West. Everybody with guns and so forth. This was the National um, uh, Islamic Center in, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, back to Yemen, uh, Shepherd. Um, City Center Mall uh, here in uh, Dubai. I just saw that Britney Spears poster, and it was kind of a simple thing to, to wait until the right moment. And again, uh, over in Sharjah, why. Uh, uh, you know, the, you know the, the ritual of uh, coffee for an important sheikh with his bodyguards. And uh, again, I think intimacy is, is a key here, taking people to places they can't go for themselves. And in Indonesia, I was with these young women at prayers at uh, an Islamic boarding school, um, quite devout. But as they came out of their prayers, they wanted to talk about my daughter Susanna seeing the Backstreet Boys in Washington, D.C., and they knew the Backstreet Boys. I don't know the Backstreet Boys, but I just think they were good at one time. And I think it's important that we show people 
um, all sides of people. And I, I think this maybe is the last picture of the National Mosque in um, Brunei, an Islamic Sultanate on the island of Borneo. And the women on the women's side, preparing for their uh, prayers, motioned me over. And I thought, well, this is probably not very safe territory for a guy, but they did motion me over. And I just found this little serendipitous moment, knowing that people were going to come and throw me out. And they did very ceremoniously uh, throw me out. But it uh, was worth the picture. And I'll stop here. It's this is the largest mosque in Southeast Asia. It's just outside of Kuala Lumpur. And it's the best view, I thought, from a reconnaissance of the area was from the front yard of the Sultan of Salangor. And so what did I do? I asked the security guard if I might call on the Sultan. And he said, oh, yeah, sure. And uh, so I just asked the Sultan if it was possible later that day to set up my tripod on his front yard um, to get this picture. And he said, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm going to London tonight. The guards will uh, set it all up for you. So, you know, it, it's the, you know what I'd, I'd leave you with this thought is that making um, interesting pictures is really about also imagination and the idea of what if. What if I could do this? And having kind of that... Uh, courage, I guess, to, uh, to say, well, I think I'll go try it. And the worst thing they can do is throw me out or arrest me. So with that, why, we're done. And uh, 